Good morning, my friends, and welcome to our Bible study on this wonderful and blessed Wednesday. Uh, we are certainly excited to know this is a tremendous uh, time to be studying the Word of God. Uh, as I shared, uh, for me personally, and I know for many of you, uh, this period of time between Thanksgiving and Christmas uh, is obviously a reason to, number one, be thankful. Uh, but as we move into December, and I shared it on last week, uh, it is a time for us to be joyful. Uh, in fact, I was thinking about a song that was recorded many years ago by Andy Williams entitled, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. Uh, and some of the beginning lyrics of that classic song we hear during this time of the year, it says, with kids jingle belling and everyone telling you be of good cheer. Uh, and this really should be the most wonderful time of the year, but for many of us and for many of you, uh, it is really not the most wonderful time of the year because we don't know what makes this time of the year so wonderful. Uh, and so in this Bible study, I, I want to help give us some substance, right, uh, to what it is that makes this the most wonderful time uh, of the year. So what I'm going to attempt to do, I am actually going to attempt to summarize the entire uh, letter or epistle that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. So the book of Philippians... Uh, it is a very short New Testament letter, four chapters. I want to give you one assignment. I'll give you some others later. But your assignment uh, after this Bible study is to read uh, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, four chapters, the book of Philippians. Just, just read it. It won't take you very long, but I do want you to read uh, these four chapters. Uh, as, a launching, as a launching verse for our Bible study, I'm simply going to go right to the middle of this wonderful epistle. It's actually called the Epistle of Joy or a Joy uh, Letter, okay? Uh, and so I want simply to focus on Philippians 3, verse 1. Just the first verse of uh, chapter 3. Uh, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version of Holy Scripture. Uh, follow along with me. Paul uh, writes, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, to write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Let me read it again. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard, a safeguard for you. Uh, as we get into our Bible study today, our Bible study is simply entitled Rejoice. All right? Rejoice. Uh, understand, obviously, when we use the prefix re, that means to do something over again, right? So Paul here in the text uh, is, is, is encouraging us, or through the Holy Spirit, we are being commanded. It's not a suggestion. We are commanded to rejoice or have joy over and over and over again. What we're going to do in this lesson is find out how it is that we do this. How is it that we can be obedient to this command to rejoice, to have joy over and over again? Dr. Kerry D. Wesley, uh, the late pastor of the Antioch Fellowship uh, Baptist Church uh, in Dallas, Texas, has a wonderful book entitled Rejoicing in the Lord. Uh, it is really uh, his treatment or his study of the book of Philippians. It uh, uh, is really a wonderful, encouraging book that I would uh, challenge or encourage any to read. But in that book, he summarizes uh, this very brief letter of Paul by saying uh, that there are a number of outcomes that we get from the book of Philippians. Number one, he says, uh, the believer is uh, uh, in a win-win situation no matter what verdict comes, right? He said that's the first outcome or outtake uh, from Philippians. He says, secondly, the believer will remain until his or her purpose has been fulfilled, no matter how gloomy the situation. Uh, Dr. Wesley says the third outtake from uh, Philippians, as he summarizes the letter, is this. No past accomplishment uh, can measure to our eternal security in Christ. And then his last outcome, as he summarizes the book, he says, when our faith is Christ-centered, we can experience contentment, he says, at all times, right? Uh, basically, Jesus should be 
our joy. Uh, J.A. Motyer, in his commentary uh, entitled The Message of uh, Philippians, reminds us that Paul, as he writes this letter, Philippians is one of Paul's prison letters, meaning, context being, Paul uh, is awaiting trial before Caesar. Uh, he is actually imprisoned when he writes this letter. But even while in prison, he expresses, right, joy. There's really a reciprocal encouragement in this very brief letter. Paul in prison giving encouragement to the Philippian believers, uh, and then also the Philippian believers in turn uh, expressing joy and encouragement uh, to Paul. So they are mutually, right, uplifting uh, one another. But but J.A. Motyer in his message of Philippians says that there are three things he would want us to take away from Philippians. First of all, uh, realize the joy or have joy that Christ is being proclaimed, right? Uh, he also says uh, there should be joy in fellowship with other believers. And then he finally says there should be joy in Jesus himself. But then I want to move to Dr. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who in his exposition of Philippians, dealing with chapters 3 and 4, talks about a life of peace that, that basically uh, emanates, right, from, from knowing how to rejoice in the Lord or having true rejoicing. And so Paul here uh, in Philippians 3 and 1 again says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. It's very interesting that, that, that here at the beginning of chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, finally. Now, most times when someone says finally, that means they're getting very close to concluding. But Paul says finally here in verse 1, but then we've got chapter 3 and chapter 4. Uh, that, that, that makes me believe that, that Paul possibly had uh, a Baptist preacher's spirit where we often will say that we're about to conclude, but then we think of something else uh, and we keep going. But that's basically what happened here with Paul. Paul says finally. And when he says it, there's a transition. Uh, and as he's transitioning, or, or really maybe wanting to conclude, he suddenly thinks of something else uh, that he wants to say. That sounds so much like uh, a preacher. We're ready to close, but then we think about something else we want to say. Paul says, I've got something else I want, I want to say. Now, many of us, when we think of Philippians, we think of Philippians 4, 4. There are a number of verses in Philippians that really resonate and come to our mind that we can recite from memory. Uh, one of those being Philippians 4 and 4, where Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Paul wrote this letter in order to teach the Philippian believers how to rejoice in the Lord. That is the theme and the message. And so what he does is he practically dictates or talks about various things, first of all, that would attempt to rob us of our joy. Uh, he talks about the difficulties, right, with being able to rejoice, the impediments, the obstacles, uh, the life situations that, that keep us from being able to have joy over uh, and over. Uh, and and what, he's talk, what he deals with, uh, first of all, he talks about circumstances, right? Circumstances can keep us from being able to rejoice in the Lord. In chapter 1, Paul talks about his circumstance, about his imprisonment, right? His own particular state of being. But he says, you need not worry about me because to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul says, it was immaterial or does not matter what is going on in my life, whether I'm put to death or not, I am still going to rejoice, he says, in the Lord. But then he goes further in chapter 1 and says, Often criticism and what people say uh, about us as we're trying to work uh, and serve the Lord. Criticism, right, uh, can, can, can really rob us, right, of our joy. Paul says that that next trouble uh, can, can cause trouble. So Paul says, uh, in spite of what people are saying, uh, he says whether people are actually serving the Lord, preaching from wrong motives or from right motives. He says from wrong motives pretense or truth, Paul says rejoice because Christ is being preached. Persecutions being experienced, Paul says this is how we deal with these things and maintain our joy. Paul goes on in chapter 2 to talk about uh, how conflict, right, not getting along with others, 
uh, can rob us of our joy. Uh, there is a tendency to experience jealousy and even envy from others whenever you're trying to serve the Lord. But Paul says in chapter 2, let this mind be in you, right, which was also in Christ Jesus. For if that mind that was in Christ is in us, then, then our joy, Paul says, will be maintained. And then Paul says confusion, right, uh, can, can cause us uh, to be robbed of joy. He talks about false teachers, uh, Judaizers, uh, who cause intellectual doubt and theological confusion. Don't, don't allow confusion, conflict, circumstances, or criticism, Paul says, to rob us of joy, right? So, command, Philippians 3 and 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Command, Philippians 4 and 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I will say rejoice. How do we live up to this command? Well, I want to divide the remainder of the Bible study into three parts. Number one, we're going to talk about what does it mean to rejoice in the Lord. First thing we're going to talk about, what does it mean to rejoice in the Lord? Secondly, why should we rejoice in the Lord? Then thirdly, how do we rejoice in the Lord? So let's pivot to question one. What does it mean to rejoice in the Lord? Uh, the first thing that strikes us is that it is a command, right? It is not a description of the state in which we find ourselves as much as we are exhorted simply to do it. The tendency uh, is always to think of joy as some subjective state or condition. My friends, joy is not a subjective experience. It is an objective reality. Uh, it is not something we experience. Many people are unhappy because they are not, listen, experiencing joy. But joy is not a subjective experience. Uh, it is not based on our circumstances. It is an objective reality. The idea that joy is the result of things that happens to us. Listen, uh, believers or that believers or you and I have no control over things that we are uh, not capable of rejoicing uh, and that the end result of interaction and the interoperation of forces and factors in our life is beyond our reach. Listen, Paul is refuting that. Paul says that is an error. The error is exposed in the command that we are to rejoice. Now, there are a couple of dangers, right? There are a couple of dangers that we need to be aware of. Uh, the first danger is the danger of trying to produce this state of rejoicing by making a direct attack on our emotions. Here's what I mean. Some will say rejoicing and happiness belong to the realm of emotions, so we must do things to ourselves emotionally in order to get into this happy state. And we've got to be very careful because a lot of times we do this even in church. Uh, yes, we need to set the atmosphere. But oftentimes, listen, if you are a true child of God, you ought to enter his gates with thanksgiving, come into his courts with praise, and not have to have joy manufactured mechanically in order to make you joyful, right? Now, listen, uh, so Paul says, th this is what is meant, Paul says, by a direct attack on the emotions, an attempt to do things to our emotional life which are calculated and manip manipulated to lead to a particular result. This is a very dangerous thing in our contemporary church. One of the most dangerous things we can ever do, and is the highest road that leads to false teaching and various cults. In many ways, there are many ways in which people can make themselves feel happy. It can be drugs, it can be some other substance, it can be uh, manipulating circumstances, uh, entering into the realm of make-believe, uh, or, or an endless variety of ways. The major trouble of our day is that the world is full of trouble and un unhappiness. And so instead of facing these realistically and adopting the Christian way of surmounting these difficulties, people deliberately turn their back upon their troubles in their search for joy, happiness, and peace and create, listen, an artificial sense of happiness and pleasure. Rejoicing 
is not the result of doing something immediately and directly to our emotional danger. Here is the other danger, the danger of posing or posturing uh, to be bright, happy, and cheerful. Uh, there are many who adopt a bright disposition, but many of us discover that the most depressed people give the impression of being cheerful or happy or playing at being happy. Joy for them is only skin deep, and it lacks that vital and essential quality of being able to rejoice in the Lord. So what does it mean to rejoice in the Lord? Question two, why should we rejoice in the Lord? Well, there are several reasons why we should rejoice in the Lord. First of all, we've talked about it. We've been commanded to. But we also ought to rejoice in the Lord for the Lord's sake. And thirdly, for the sake of others. Listen, uh, this idea of rejoicing in the Lord is an imperative. There are so many of them around us who are in misery, unhappy, seeking and searching for answers, going from disappointment to disappointment, sometimes even contemplating going out of life through the back door. For the sake of others, those who are defeated and frustrated by life, it is our business to radiate joy, and when they see it, they may say, there's hope for me after all. In fact, I gave you one assignment, read the book of Philippians. Here's assignment number two, and this assignment is not from me. This is a divine assignment directly from God. Your divine assignment on earth is to make God look so wonderful that your reflection of him entices people to want him just like you do. Listen, folk need to know there is hope for their situation. But then we also need to rejoice in the Lord for our own sake, right? For our own sake, we ought to rejoice in the Lord. One of the greatest safeguards against most of the dangers that confront us is found in Nehemiah 8 and 10, which says the joy of the Lord is our strength. This is an obvious psychological principle. If you are not properly centered in the Lord, you have problems before you even begin. So Paul says, rejoice, what? In the Lord. Because it, it is the only joy that will never fail us. Let me say it again. Uh, our joy in the Lord is the only joy that will never fail us. Listen, I preached this past Sunday from John chapter 16, verse 33. And Jesus says that in me, uh, listen, you'll have peace, you'll have joy. In the world, you'll have tribulation. When you back up to verse 32 of John 16, Jesus says, the test will come when we find ourselves stripped of all that the world offers. Then we will find that this joy, our joy in the Lord, is the only joy that abides. It will never leave us nor forsake us because he, according to Hebrews 13 and 5, will never leave us nor forsake us. So if I'm rejoicing in him, I am in an invulnerable position, for nothing can come between me and the love of God. That's what Paul says in Romans 8, verse 38 and 39. Third question that we must deal with is this. How are we to rejoice in the Lord? Uh, rejoicing in the Lord or joy is something that results uh, from a realization of our position in Christ. Remember I said joy or rejoicing in the Lord is not a subjective experience, right? It is an objective uh, reality. Uh, our joy is the product or byproduct of, uh, of our concentration upon our relationship to God in Jesus Christ. Rejoicing is a position, positional rejoicing. Again, John 16, 33, in me you'll have joy and peace. Romans 8, 38 and 39, Paul reminds us that if we are positionally secure in Christ, then we can rejoice and have joy at all times. Three propositions, right, on how to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to share one negative and write two positive. And by negative, I mean something that we shouldn't do, right? And positively, obviously, these are the two things that we must do, right? So the first negative, the negative proposition is we must be able to control other sources of joy, 
What do you mean by that? If I find my joy is dependent upon anything which can be taken from me, I must correct it. If I'm finding my joy and my peace in anything that can be taken from me, I must correct it. In other words, uh, uh, th there are many things in life that are permissible by God. In fact, ordained of God for us to enjoy. But if those things have taken the place of Jesus or taken the place of God and Jesus is not the center of our joy, we cannot build our hopes on insecure foundations, right? So we've got to be able to control other sources of joy. From a positive standpoint, uh, Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, we ought to meditate on him, right? We cannot rejoice in the Lord without thinking about him. We must deliberately turn our eyes from other things and dwell on him. We are encouraged to do this in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and also 2. You have to look at him in order to rejoice in him. The third positive proposition is this. We must meditate on what he has done for us. Uh, he has not only started this work, uh, the Bible reminds us that he will continue this work until the day of Jesus Christ. My friends, I want to share a couple of texts uh, from John chapter 15, uh, verse 11, and then also John chapter 17 and verse 13, uh, and help us to know what uh, the Lord's goal is for us uh, literally as we are living uh, this Christian life. John 15, verse 11. Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full or your joy may be complete. Now, when you go to John chapter 17, verse 13, Jesus says, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full and complete. Uh, the Lord wants our joy, right, to be complete. He wants us to be able to rejoice, to have joy over and over and over again, despite and in spite of any circumstances or situations that go on in our life. Uh, but the admonishment is that we are to rejoice in the Lord. Do not forget your assignment. I've tried to summarize the book of Philippians in a very short few minutes, but I want you to read those four chapters, right? Uh, read those chapters, and I'll, listen, when you meditate, study, and read the Word of God, you'll find the Lord uh, elevating your heart, elevating your joy, and you'll find yourself rejoicing in the Lord over and over and over again. I, I want to remind you of a few things as we close we are certainly in the wonderful holiday season in our music ministry. Uh, you'll see this on the screen after we close. Uh, we'll have a musical here at the church uh, on this Sunday, December the 10th. Uh, we want to invite you, if you're near, to come uh, in person. Uh, celebrate with us as we sing songs uh, of the season. Uh, they have been preparing. We'd love to have you. There will be guests that will be here with them. Uh, if you're not able or not close, uh, you can certainly watch us uh, watch this wonderful musical celebration uh, online. Uh, you'll find also many opportunities to serve and to become a part uh, of our church and our ministries. Uh, we would love to have you here, certainly with us, and you'll also see ways and opportunities that you can give and to support our church if you find that what we are doing is a blessing, certainly to your life. God will bless you for that. I want to close in prayer, and again, when I close in prayer, uh, I certainly want you to see the information that we are sharing about our church. Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. God, we know that this is and should be the most wonderful time of the year again, but for many, uh, it is a time of despair, uh, a time of sadness, a time of depression. But God, we pray that through this study, God, they would know what it means to rejoice in the Lord, why we should rejoice in the Lord, and hopefully how to rejoice in the Lord. God, remind each and all that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And as Psalm 16 and 11 says, in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. 
So God, I pray the fullness of joy upon each and every one that is listening. And God, I pray that you would bless him with the joy that only comes from you. It is in Jesus' wonderful and mighty name I pray. Amen.